Good evening, and greetings in the name of the one we come to worship and love and remember tonight, our Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to see so many of you here on this Monday, Thursday evening. This is a communion service. It's a service of preparing our hearts uh, to remember Friday when Jesus died on the cross. And First Peter says this, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. And it's really all about the death of Jesus Christ, and we're going to hear a little bit about that tonight. But this is such an important night because Easter is wonderful because the crucifixion of Jesus Christ was so terrible. Easter is beautiful because the crucifixion was so ugly. Easter is everything because Christ gave his all on the cross. And so tonight we want to remember that. And the best way to to celebrate the glorious resurrection is to enter into uh, the death and sacrifice of Jesus Christ as best we are able by the Holy Spirit. So let me pray and then the the service will unfold uh, without announcement. Our Lord and God, we come to you tonight. We thank you that the prelude has prepared us to meditate upon your sacrificial death for us. And as we sing some songs and hear some readings from the Bible, as we celebrate communion and hear a meditation on your great love, and as we leave here in a quiet manner, we pray that we would depart with a better heartfelt grip on your crucifixion. Help us, for we are weak. Help our minds and hearts to enter into the, to the sorrow and sadness, to the reality of what you experience for all of us tonight. Thank you for bringing a good portion of your body, Jesus, to this house of worship tonight, that we might give our hearts to you even as you feed us through the Lord's Supper. So we offer ourselves to you, we offer this service to you. In your name we pray, amen. Now when Jesus was at Bethany in the house of Simon the leopard, a woman came up to him with an alabaster flask, a very expensive ointment, and she poured it on his head as he reclined at the table. In the pouring of this ointment on my body, she has done it to prepare me for burial. Truly, I say to you, wherever this gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her.
Then one of the twelve, whose name was Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What will you give me if I deliver him over to you? And they paid him thirty pieces of silver. And from that moment, he sought an opportunity to betray him. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for my forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. And when they had and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Let's pray together. Our Lord, as we come to this table tonight, we thank you so much for being our sin-bearer, Lord Jesus. We thank you that we can fulfill your word. As long as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. So thank you for this meal. Thank you for this supper. Would you feed us, please, spiritually? Would you assure us once again that our sins are forgiven, that we belong to you in body and soul and life and in death? Come, Lord Jesus. Our soul is thirsty for you. Our soul is hungry for you, the bread of life, the light of the world. In your name we pray, amen. 
Brothers and sisters in Christ, the meal we are about to celebrate is a feast according to the Bible. It's a feast of remembrance, of communion, and of hope. We come to remember that our Lord Jesus Christ was sent of the Father into the world to assume our flesh and blood and to fulfill all obedience to the divine law, even to the bitter and shameful death of the cross. We come also to have communion with this same Christ who promises to be with us even to the end of the age. In the breaking of the bread, he comes to us as the true bread of life who strengthens us unto life eternal. And in the cup, he comes to us as the true vine in whom we must abide in order to bear fruit. We come in remembrance and communion. But we also, friends, come in hope, believing that this cup and this bread are a foretaste and pledge of that wonderful banquet that we will one day enjoy together when Christ returns, when with unveiled face we shall behold him as he is and be changed into his likeness. So as we come to this table now, let us be mindful of the communion of saints. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, this is my body which is given for you. Do this as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. If you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you have repented of your sin, you are welcome to this table. Come, for all things are now ready.
Oh, how we praise Jesus for dying on the cross for our sin. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Jesus Christ. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And he said to his disciples, this cup is the new covenant shed for you in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. When we drink this and say that this is communion with Christ, we mean it in a spiritual way. 
that he is here in his Holy Spirit. And as you by faith drink, the Holy Spirit enables us together to commune with Christ and one another. So the cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of the blood of Jesus Christ through the power of the life-giving Holy Spirit. Our Lord Jesus, thank you for reminding us and working in our hearts forgiveness of sin. And may we thank you now that we are cleansed and right with you. Oh Lord, thank you for your holy meal tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand.
pray together. Our Heavenly Father, for this moment tonight, it is good for us to be here together because you are here. You are with us. You are our good shepherd, our great shepherd, tending to the needs of the soul as well as the body. You understand the needs of the soul and the body because you became a human being, Jesus. And we thank you so much tonight that you understand us. You understand us perfectly. And you are the medicine for our soul. You are the healing for our wounds. You are the sunshine in our darkness. You are the balm for what ails us. Be our medicine now. Strengthen us and help us to understand your death even more tonight. In your name we pray, amen. Well, it is wonderful for us to be here on a night like this. I can think of nothing better than to be with God's people on a Thursday or a Friday night of Holy Week and to reflect together on the true meaning of God's love. And that's what we want to do for these minutes tonight. You'll notice that we're looking at Romans 5, verse 8. It's a short verse, but not a simple verse. Let's say it together. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. Maybe for someone listening tonight, that's the first time you've ever heard that verse. Maybe not. But it tells us a whole lot about God's love for us. And in a day and age when people are very confused about what love is, God tells us what love is and shows us what love is in the Bible. Someone has once said that the cross of Jesus Christ dominates the New Testament. And it does. You can't go from page to page very long without something written, some story shared about the cross and the death of Jesus Christ. In fact, a person can't even understand Jesus Christ until they understand the cross. It's impossible to separate Jesus from the cross. And any attempt to do so is foolish because Christ's sole purpose was to be born in order to die. It wasn't so much his coming into the world as his dying for the world that truly defines the essence of his mission. So I'd like to take this verse and just unfold for you briefly how God demonstrated his love for you and me. Songs are written about love. Poems are shared and small groups and gatherings about love. People think they know what love is. But this is what love truly is according to God. Number one, Christ died for us as God's suffering servant. Christ died for us as God's suffering servant. God sent his son Jesus into this world to be his suffering servant. All through the Old Testament, and especially in that Isaiah 53 passage, we see that God had a suffering servant who was to come into the world. And Christ did. He was sent of God and he served the Lord's purposes. 
He fulfilled the law in every possible respect. He performed countless miracles of healing. He he showed compassion to everyone who needed his compassionate touch or word or healing. And Jesus did all this to suffer and die. He was the servant of God. And he knew that his role and calling was to suffer as a servant. And so number one, when you think of the death of Jesus Christ, remember this. Christ died for us as God's suffering servant. Number two, Christ died for us as God's willing sacrifice. Willing sacrifice. This was voluntary. Christ determined to be a sacrifice. It was his will. Don't ever think that Jesus was a martyr. Don't ever think Jesus was bound by something called fate. And by all means, don't ever think it had anything to do with bad luck. This was the plan of God for his son from before the world was made. That Christ would be a willing sacrifice. And as a willing sacrifice, Christ went to the cross where they fastened his hands to the cross beam with nails. And then they inserted the vertical beam into the hole, jolting Christ. And for the next six hours, the Son of God bore the sin of the world upon his soul. Crucifixion was probably the most painful and barbaric way to die because it prolonged death until the ultimate amount of pain had been reached. And when we look at the cross, we must not only look at the the cross and the physical body of Jesus as a willing and voluntary sacrifice. The heart of the suffering was the soul of Christ that bore the sins of men and women. And while God placed our sin upon the Son, He placed our guilt and our shame and our punishment upon the Son at the same time. And so Christ endured the wrath of God, the judgment of God against our sin, and somehow compressed mysteriously within six hours of time, Christ bore the eternal judgment of His people. In other words, simply put, God gave his son as a sacrifice and the son willingly became the sacrifice. The sacrificial ram, if you will, of Genesis 22 when Abraham was about to sacrifice his son. Thirdly, Christ died for us as God's substitute for sinners. He was not only a suffering servant, He was not only a willing sacrifice, but he was a substitute for sinners, which is the Bible's way of saying he took our place. And if Jesus took our place on the cross and suffered the judgment of God, he suffered what we deserve. That's right. Even today, we deserve the punishment that Jesus Christ bore in our place. He is the sinner's substitute. He is the one who went to the cross knowing full well what he would experience. But he hadn't experienced it yet. And he did it all for you and for me. He is the sinner's substitute. Fourthly, Christ died for us as God's security of salvation. Christ secured everlasting life and salvation for his people. 
and he secured this that we might live forever with the Father and his Son in endless, eternal celebration and joy. We will never have to face the judgment of God or the wrath of God because Christ quenched it. Like a sacrificial sponge, he absorbed and took it all in that we might never even have to taste a drop of it. That's why the Bible says that when Christ drank the cup of suffering, he drank it all the way down. Not just a drop or a sip. He drank the whole cup. And by doing that, we now have eternal security because Christ has won our everlasting salvation. It was a definite atonement for the sins of his people. Now, there's a difference between assurance and eternal security. Assurance is the human side of the equation. Eternal security is the divine side of the equation. We are eternally secure. We will never be plucked from the Father's hands. We are going to heaven if we know Christ. But assurance is another matter. Assurance speaks of what I actually experience in my heart on a day-to-day basis. And God wants the sacrifice of His Son to become more and more of daily assurance in the experience of our heart. So that we're not always fretting and doubting and wondering, does God love me? He doesn't want us to go into a a field of flowers and find a clover and start pulling off the leaf or a flower petal and say, God loves me, he loves me not. He loves me, he loves me not. And hope that the last one is he loves me. That is so foreign to biblical Christianity and so foreign to the gospel, but some of us live like that. Christ died for us as God's security of salvation. Fifthly, and there's only six. Number five, Christ died for us as God's supreme gift. The supreme gift of God. The world over today is wondering if God even exists. Or for those who believe that God exists, does God care? Does God know? Is God involved? And the gift of His Son and the sacrifice of His Son on that Friday is God's supreme gift. God demonstrated His love for us in this and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There is no greater gift. In fact, Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, 15, thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. It is beyond words, isn't it? But we must say something about it. And maybe the highest thing we can say is it's the greatest act of love God could show us. That's the most, to give his own son. There's no higher love than the sacrifice of Christ. And sixth and finally, Christ died for us, friends, as God's self-giving act of love. You see, Christ was not only a willing sacrifice. The Father himself, in great love for the people for whom Christ came to save, gave his Son, so there was on the Father's part a, a, an act of self-giving love. And people, does God love, does God care? Yes, you look to the old rugged cross and there you see love as current as this Thursday night at Over Isle Reformed Church. And you don't have to question it or doubt it. God just wants you by faith to enter into it. You know, the world today has many forms of twisted love confused love, and even perverted love, according to the Bible. When you let people do whatever they want to do, you are not loving them. When people teach 
you can live however your heart and your feelings lead you to live. We're not loving them. Love is defined by the biblical cross of Jesus Christ. And Christ's sacrifice and God's giving of his son defines love in a world that is so confused, utterly confused about what love is. And so God showed his love for us in this and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Someone has said, as a result of all you've just heard from Romans 5.8, our sin must be extremely horrible. God's love must be wonderful beyond comprehension. Both are true. Let's pray together. Thank you, Father, for demonstrating your love and defining love for us tonight. What wondrous love is this, O oh God. We thank you from the bottom of our heart that you've opened our eyes and our heart to see the sacrifice of Christ for sinners like us. Hallelujah. We bless you and praise you tonight, Lord Jesus, for what you endured on our behalf. In your name we pray. Amen. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled. <laughs> 